Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques. So I'll, I'll let it. So Mo Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques form a family of techniques that has transformed much of certain areas of the statistical world. Interestingly, these techniques date back to the 1940s when, as I understand it, they actually originated in the context of the Manhattan Project, the, the, the project that, that um, was involved in, uh, in creating, the, uh, ironically, the atomic bomb. And uh, these techniques uh, provide a remarkable way of sampling from a distribution that cannot be cannot be sampled from in a in a in a trivial way. Uh, for example, a distribution as implied by a simulation model, where we don't know its form. Okay, now. At a, at a certain level, you can view MCMC techniques as a combination of, on the one hand, calibration, and on the other hand, sensitivity analysis, okay? Two key processes in dynamic modeling. Alex, thanks greatly for that. Much appreciated. So in calibration with, well, also I, I put in a, a lecture for that, which may yet happen on Friday. And I'd welcome it if, if you'd like me to give a lecture on calibration and, and Yang Chen might be able to contribute some commentary from her model. Um, calibration is a process, thanks greatly, of adjusting our assumptions about parameters. Thanks again. That, no, no, it's good. Adjusting our assumption about parameters in the model so that they best, so that the model's output, the model's emergent behavior best matches what's observed empirically, okay? Um, and typically it gives us single estimates of parameter values. You may remember me talking about this earlier. It gives us an estimate that says, the best match is for this value for those parameters you were wondering about. That's what yields the model's emergent behavior, those patterns we saw in the first day that came out of the model to match empirical data. And the idea is we say, oh, okay, well, these parameters we don't know very well, let's calibrate them to best match the data. And then when it matches the data best, we say, that looks like a pretty good match, so we'll assume those parameter values, okay? And traditionally it gives a single point estimate of those parameters. And you put your eggs in that basket and say, those are the values I'm going to assume for those parameters, and you move forward with them in your model. There's a number of limitations to this. Um, one thing is you, you have point estimates for it. Even if you have interval estimates, uh, it's, it's often it's a, not something that's, that's going to tell you about whether there's other estimates that are very different that are going to give an equal match is just around that estimate, how, how, how sensitive is it? And it turns out that, um, that there's a further restriction, it may not be obvious, which is you're counting on, on this model being, being the correct one. Now, um, MCMC is an approach that allows us to go beyond point estimates and get a distribution Get, essentially recognize what are the distribution of possible values that, that plausibly match the observed data. Recognizing that there's some, there's some error in our, in our data as well that we're trying to match against. Maybe, maybe the errors are such that you know, some higher values of the parameters would actually best match the true underlying situation. So, we're going to try to arrive at a distribution of possible values for the parameters. And we're going to call that the posterior distribution. It's a distribution informed by the empirical data. And the, the simulation model will play a key role in this because we're trying to find the values, a distribution for the parameters of the simulation model that will lead the simulation model to match 
the, the data uh, from the world quite well. Taking into account the data from the world is also a variable. But before that, we have what's called a prior distribution. We may have some best guesses for how those, those parameters are distributed that we want to reflect in our algorithm, okay? And so I'm going to introduce some notation here, and I'm going to try to introduce this algorithm. Ironically, this is an algorithm would, which would really benefit from a whiteboard. I could show it on a whiteboard, it would be really nice. But alas, I locked a whiteboard today, okay? Um, I don't even have a blackboard. A, a boogie board? <laughs> a big one? Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take it, take it from you. Know, I, uh, I think uh, Australia is familiar with boogie, boogie boards. Um, uh, okay, so um, we're going to use a notation. We're going to assume theta or some parameters in the model that we're not sure about, and we want to we want to arrive at values for those that give, that help the model match the observed data well. Recognizing that there's uncertainties in that observed data from the world. And why is the observed data? Um, it's, it's the data from the world, it's the empirical data, okay? Now in contrast to, to um, particle filtering, this may sound a lot like particle filtering, but it's different. There's two big things that should be stand out in your mind soon about why this is different. One thing that's different is in terms of the goal. Particle filtering is trying to estimate, its main focus is estimating the state of the model over time. What's the underlying situation over time? What was that? What, what was the sequence of, of um, uh, in terms of the number of infected people over time who are afflicted with measles um, for Saskatchewan, or, or uh, for an individual, what was their sequence in terms of the level of depression at different points in time? So in particle filtering, we're trying to match the underlying state of the model, the latent state of the model. And sometimes we throw parameters in there like Xiaoyan and, uh, and on heated it, they threw some parameters in there, um, try to match them, like the contact rate. But basically those became part of the state of the model. Um, here, we're trying to estimate parameter values. We're, trying to, we're not trying to get an understanding, a read on the changing state of the model, how many people are sick at day 100, and day 101, day 102, and day 103. Rather, we're trying to estimate the parameter values that are static, that are fixed, that are, that are not changing. That's one difference between particle filtering and MCMC. A second difference that kind of goes along with that is that the observed data here for particle filter, for, for, for it's, it's different in both cases. For particle filtering, the observed data is, is really data for time. You want to have data for time. You want to have, it may not be for every time point, but you want to have time marked data. And it can't be for every time, it's continuous time conceptually. But, um, but the point is, it doesn't, it can be intermittent, but it needs to be time index. It needs to be marked in terms of time. For MCMC, that's not at all a need. No, it's just, it's data that the model needs to match. It can be data over time. And uh, often it is, but it needn't be, okay? Um, okay, now, we're going to be trying to estimate values for the model parameters that will lead it to best match this observed data Y. And we're not gonna get, we're not gonna put all our eggs in the basket of a single value for those parameters that we trust and privilege and use from now on. We're going to have a distribution, okay? Um, and, uh, and this is going to allow us to understand the relative likelihood of parameter values uh, within the model. Um, and by then sampling from this distribution, we're going to be able to calculate, for example, credibility intervals 
for model output, which means basically we'll be able to have our expectations of model output within bands, with distributions over the model output, or you know some uh, probability that one intervention was better than another intervention, or some distribution about how much money we would save with this intervention compared to that one by a certain point in time. So we're going to have this distribution of values over parameters that we can then sample from and run the model with different sample parameter values, see the results, and get a distribution of, over those results. That's really what we're doing here. We're trying to, trying to get a distribution over parameters so we can get a distribution over model outputs and results. Hmm? They say that um, for Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, um, at the time he conducted the Ninth, ninth Symphony, um, Beethoven had a very hard time composing. He was notoriously hard on himself. He even hired a maid to, to pour cold water over him um, on a frequent basis to try to jar his, his sort of creativity. And uh, I think she had to mop it up afterwards. Um, anyway, he, he, he was very tough on himself, is what I've read, in terms of composing. And, um, uh, you know, with the Ninth Symphony, this was going to be his final symphony. And uh, you can hear him experimenting. His, his choral fantasy has sort of attempts exploring what might be you know, subject matter for the Ninth Symphony, but he discarded it. It's a great piece of work itself. But anyway, he, he finally came up with the Ninth Symphony, uh, for which he's famous, of course, um, in addition to many other symphonies, but this one particularly well known. And um, at the time he came, he finished it. He was deaf. Born guy was deaf. But he wanted to conduct it. He wanted to conduct the Ninth Symphony. And um, in its premier performance. He went before the, uh, the symphony. Um, I think it was in Vienna, but I'm not sure. In any case, it was, uh, it was a, a famous occasion. And people recognized that this, you know, this might be his last time conducting a symphony ever after having contributed nine beautiful symphonies. Maybe it was his last time conducting it, but I don't, don't know. But he was deaf. And as you can imagine, that's, that's a challenge you conduct. Um, and, um, you know, there have been many rehearsals and so on. And uh, he went to conduct, and he was facing the, um, he was facing the, uh, the orchestra and conducting. And, uh, you know, he was conducting, and, and it got out of sync with the orchestra uh, because he couldn't hear what they were playing. And so he was, I think, you know, a minute off or something like that. And so when he finished conducting, the actual orchestra had finished playing. And apparently the house, the people in the audience were going crazy. They, they just loved the Ninth Symphony. And they started ripping, you can't imagine this, but they started ripping off the upholstery and throwing the cushions in the air and hats and so on. And he was completely oblivious to this. They were you know, much louder than the orchestra being were cheering, but he was still facing the, the, the uh, the players. And so someone had to come up and turn them around. And, and you know, the, the, the room was just going crazy with people throwing things and cheering and so on. And, and you know, um, I haven't seen that yet in my book. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe, maybe in my last boot camp, I'll, I'll, I'll see it. Uh, uh, That's right. Also, don't, please, please don't rip up the, <laughs> don't rip up the upholstery, okay? Um, don't, don't take that literally. I, yeah, Christine will, yeah, I'll paper out of pocket or something. Um, but, but in any case, um, you know, sometimes they're trying to read a crowd for what their interest is, and, you know, if they're going crazy like that, I'll figure, okay, I guess I'll continue. Um, but uh, if they're not, then, then I have to reread my expectations. So here we're trying to sample from parameter values um, uh, 
to, to try to assess the model results. We can get distributions over the model results. Not, not one privileged result out of the model, but a distribution reflecting our uncertainty about theta, about the parameters in light of the observed data. Okay, so MCMC is a principled way of generating samples from this posterior distribution implied by the data in light of the model. So the fact that we need to match this real world data with model output, it implies a distribution over parameter values such that, that they will allow good informed matches to that real world data that recognizing the real world data has, um, has error and sort of uh, measurement error associated with it and so on. And what we do here is, is uh, we conduct what's called a Monte Carlo experiment. So we sample from theta again and again. We draw values of theta for different parameter values for the same model, um, each of which is a legitimate sample. But the ones that are really good matches are drawn more frequently. They're drawn more commonly. It's just like in particles when we give them a high weight, here we draw them frequently. So ones that are really good matches will be very frequent. But you know, there's some chance that because of the error in the real world data that some of these other parameter values are possible. It's not that likely. And so we'll have some of those thrown in there at, at, at lower rates. And, and it takes into account our, the fallibility of our data um, in terms of, 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 of wanting to count on. So um, for each sample, we'll often accumulate it, and then we'll often um, calculate things over it or calculate which intervention is best with that parameter value, or for that parameter value, what's the, the result of projecting the model forward so we can get probabilistic uh, projections. Okay, so um, basically, when you're applying MCMC, and PMCMC, which will follow, where it's combined with particle filtering in a sort of way that's like rocket fuel for what you can deduce. Um, basically, you're going to decide on prior distributions. This is sort of your best guesses for what the distribution of parameters are up, up front. And then you're going to have to formulate, like for particle filtering, you're going to have to formulate likelihood functions that will specify, hey, given model output, what's now watch this. This is a key point. Because it's the same as in particle filtering. Given model output, output from that simulation model, what's the likelihood that you would observe the data that you give? The observed data. Okay? So if you run the model with, with a certain parameter, you see output, what's the chance you would have observed? Given the underlying situation of the model depicted by running the model, the underlying situation of the state of the world, what's the likelihood you would have observed that empirical data that, that it's in fact collected? That's what you need to specify in the likelihood function. Something that says, hey, um, is it likely that, that, that this underlying situation as depicted by the model by running it with this parameter would, would yield that that output, um, that's what you have to specify. Um, and having specified that, the method basically does its magic and, and allows you to, to sample from parameter values according to, to what's called Bayes' theorem, okay, Bayes' rule. Um, now, I'm gonna skip this. Conceptually, there's, um, well, okay, I, I mean, wh why, why do this? You can say, well, why don't we just why don't we just draw samples? Because we don't know how to draw samples. I mean, <laughs> MCMC is how we draw samples um, from distributions where we can't specify up front where, what they are. There's, no, there's not a better real way to do this. Um, when, we, when we can't formulate the distribution, um, it's a very complex distribution as to how certain values for parameters will allow the model to match this, this observed data. And I can't just, I can't just Say, give me a parameter that matches it really well. There's no real way to do that. MCMC is the way to do it. Okay, it's based on Bayes' rule, which I'm, I won't go into here um, because I'm, I'm not focusing on the mathematical underpinnings, as I will in a course next fall. Mm. Okay, so how does this work? Basically what happens is the following. 
It's a very elegant, very elegant approach. Okay, basically you draw a candidate value from theta, which is, is totally unprivileged. It's just, you, 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 try, you try getting a value that is similar to a value you got last time plus some perturbation, some disturbance. So it's, it's like the value you got last time plus some, some, no, some, um, random, um, some random value around it according to a multidimensional normal distribution. So you add a multidimensional normal distribution to that. So we have some value that, that we got last time and we'll try taking a variant of it. And then you basically assess, okay, what's the posterior value for that new candidate value? That's a candidate value. We're not necessarily going to accept it. We want to say, are we going to accept it? Well, okay, we're going to check its posterior probability. Um, and to do that, we're going to run the simulation model. You'll get output from the simulation model. We'll compute the likelihood function. Um, given that for that output, as implied by the parameter value. So using this parameter set of parameter values we've got, we'll plug it into the simulation model, run it, we'll get some output, and we'll say, okay, for that output, according to the likelihood function, what's the likelihood we would observe this data from the real world? And we'll multiply that likelihood by this prior distribution. And the reason we multiply it is in terms of Bayes' theorem, okay? So, so Bayes' rule is the reason that we can do this. Basically, um, it so happens that if you compute this and you take the ratio between this value and the corresponding value of the last generated sample, if, if this value is bigger than that value, you always accept this new one. You say, hey, that's one of my samples. That's one of the samples, I'm going to emit that as a sample. Otherwise, you repeat the last sample. Oh, sorry. Otherwise, if it's less than or equal to it, you accept it with that probability. So if this value for the current value of theta divided by the corresponding value P of this, the same formula for the last one we emitted is less than, is less than 1, then we roll a dice between 0 and 1, and if it's if it's less than that value, we, we output this new one, otherwise we output the old one, okay? So, um, so in short, we either repeat the last one, if it's if the, the, more, the less and less likely this posterior value is, this P of Y given theta times P of theta, the less and less likely, the smaller and smaller that value is to, compared to the last one, the less and less likely we'll accept this new one and the more likely we'll just stick with the old one. If we accept this new one, theta, that becomes now our new place in space. And we're going to pick a perturbation around that, a sort of variation around that. Otherwise, we stick at the old one and pick another variation around that. So, so what this is doing is it's, it's repeating things that are very likely to occur. And at the same time, it's exploring. And if it finds one that's also very likely, there's a pretty good chance that it will go to that and it'd be exploring that. And so basically, it's, it's trying different values of theta that are variants around recent ones. If, if they're good enough, it will use them and then find variants around them. Otherwise, it will use the good old, the oldie but goodies and uh, continue to find variants around that. So in short, this is a way of generating these samples. The samples themselves from this distribution are theta. Those are the values of the parameters that we are sampling. And we want to find many values of parameters will allow the model to plausibly match this observed data. But we recognize with the likelihood function, there's, you know, there's many interpretations to that data. For, for our current situation, for model output, um, there's a certain likelihood of seeing that data. But the data itself doesn't tell us definitively what is the case. And so, this algorithm allows us to recognize there's many possible explanations, theta, many possible values of parameters that are consistent with that observed data. And this is a way of, of sampling them, okay? So we're, we're taking parameter values, we're creating variants of them 
and we are trying out those variants, the so-called candidates. We're sussing out how good the value of the posterior is. This is the likelihood function times the prior, which we specify. Often you assume a uniform prior if you don't have a strong thing. Any theta is equally likely, say, within a range. This is the likelihood function, just as in particle filtering you're saying. Maybe it's a log normal distribution, or maybe it's a, um, a normal distribution, or maybe it's a negative binomial, like Zhao Yan and Anahita were using. And this is the posterior value, and the more and more likely the posterior, the more and more uh, high this posterior value is for a given theta, the more likely you are to, to output it, to, to accept that value, you, uh, output it as one of your samples, and use that as your current point um, to find variance around that. So here we're looping. We're looping until we get something like 10,000 samples of parameters that are plausible. The ones that are really good, that yield really good results, they'll be repeated many times. Why? Because they have a really high posterior value. And, and it's unlikely we'll find one around it that's as good. And as a result, it's quite likely we'll just stay and emit our existing value again and look for another candidate. Maybe we'll find another candidate that's not nearly as good and we'll just stay and re-emit. So things that are, uh, are the good one again. So things that are really powerful in terms of matching the observed data will be sampled many, many, many times. Things that are poor at matching the observed data won't be sampled many times at all, but maybe occasionally sampled because, hey, they're possible with the likelihood function that, that it's possible they could yield the observed data. Um, but things that are more plausible will be sampled more. This likelihood function that we're using, that likelihood function, how do we assess the likelihood of observing data given these parameter values? There's a key thing that that has to do. And what is that thing that that has to do? Maybe one of my students could tell me. Speak up. What has to be done to assess this likelihood function, what do we need? What do we need to assess the value of that likelihood function? Hmm? We need, okay, so I have a model, and I have a certain parameters that I'm assuming. I mean, if I say, oh, the parameters contact rate is 0.23 per day, and, and you know, the, the fraction reported is 0.15. If I said that, can I say, what's the likelihood of observing this output data, of uh, uh, this empirical data? Can I just go from that? I say, contract rate 0.23 and, and uh, fraction reporting 0.15. Can I just immediately look at that? Do you think I could look at that and say, oh, the likelihood is such and such that the model will produce that. What do I have to do? I have to do what? I have to do what to the model? Well, what do you do to the model? Don't tell me you know, question. Um, what, what, what do you do to the model? You, I'll, give, I'll give you a hint. It's, it ends with an N. It begins with an R. It has a U in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> you run the model. You run the model on that parameter, those parameters. So assessing this likelihood function involves running the model. That gives us the output, okay? This is because the likelihood, assessing the likelihood, generally you can't assess it just from the parameter. You, you put those parameters into the model, and then you run the model. And then you get output. And that output tells you, over time, how many people are susceptible, affected, recovered, exposed, or whatever. And from that, you might be able to say, what's the likelihood we would have observed this empirical data? Hmm. Hmm. That's how you, you, you evaluate the likelihood. You actually have to run the model with the parameter values. OK? OK. That is the point here. Um, so this, this algorithm is looping, finding assumptions for the 
finding assumptions for the model in the form of parameters that will be competitive in terms of the likelihood um, it times the, the prior. So the, there, there, there are competitive explanations in terms of explaining this real world data. Okay? Um, and we're going to be having ones that have really good matching repeated many times and things that have poor matching reported, reported almost none at all. Yeah? So what's, what do you mean by the, what's the burn-in time? Oh, okay. The burn-in the burn is something um, that that we do, because initially when we assume a theta, when we start the model in MCMC, when we start it off, we have to assume some theta. So we're looking for some plausible um, uh, value of parameters that will at least allow the model to have some chance of matching this observed data. In other words, the likelihood initially, we, we need to find a theta so it's the likelihood of seeing the observed data is not zero, okay? We're, we're trying to find something that makes it at least remotely plausible that we'd see the real world data we do. That's where we start off. And the problem is, when we try to find that, that initial point, we may find, we may find one that we don't want to, we don't want to put too, too big, we don't want to privilege that point, okay? And so, rather than then treating that as our first sample and then sampling around that, which are sort of dependent on the vagaries of what we found. We run this time, we run the, the MCMC typically for like a thousand samples before, or sometimes it's more than that, before we start actually recording these. So we wanted to forget, forget the vagaries of where it happened to start. Because as it's sampling this, it's going to be getting better and better. You'll note that if we find a candidate, so we're going to take where we are now in terms of we're at a certain point making certain assumptions about parameters. We're going to find a variant of it, and we're going to assess the value of this posterior for the variant. If that's better, we're going to automatically go there. Okay? It turns out we're going to, we're going to automatically go there. It's only if that one is worse, the candidate, that we have a chance of going there. So if it's better, we're going to go there. And what this is going to mean in the first thousand steps or more, we're going to be gravitating towards areas of posterior that are higher and higher likelihood, higher and higher posterior value. Okay? So that's, that initial time, it's often highly influenced by the vagaries of which initial point we found. And so we want to we want to forget about it. It's like um, it's like your warm up time for those of you who work out. It's like your warm up time um, when you're working out. Um, you know, so when I go down and run here, um, you know, there's going to be a few early minutes where I'm just getting going, um, and then and then I'm into my routine, and uh, my body is kind of. Um, uh, is, is you know in a in a mode which where it's it's, it's performant, and so it is with this. We we throw out the first thousand samples. Now I would note, Leanne, that we sometimes do this for simulation models for like agent based models. Um, we will simulate them in the past. We'll throw away the first little bit because it depends on the vagaries of the initial model state. Um, I, you even saw this with Refots particle filter. Remember in Reflux particle filter, there was an initial transient where it had really high values and then it came down? It was just due to something a little silly with the initial values of it. And it's hard to get the initial assumptions in a model to be perfect. It's, it's, hard, to, it, it's hard to get them to jive with, to align with what happens later in the model, which is sometimes surprising and sometimes, um, sometimes uh, you know, quite quite unexpected, the patterns that come out of it. And it's hard to, to kind of get the initial state to, to, be, to be right, because we don't have observations typically in these models of, of, in, in the real world for all these latent factors measured in the model. And so we end up you know, putting in a latent, uh, putting in a guess as to initial state that's, that's kind of weak, because we don't have any observed data in the world directly about it. So we will sometimes in these simulation models throw away the first set of 
of, of runs, maybe the first 10 years of runs. And, um, and Young Chen's model, she's throwing away the first, how many years of, of, of data coming out of your simulation model? You're starting your simulation model and you're- 1948. 1948, and, and you're throwing away how many years? Uh, uh, 60, uh, uh, yeah, 60 years. 60 years. Yeah. Um, so you're doing that because you're dealing with intergenerational factors right. and and it needs a, a, a while to burn in. It needs a while to kind of get in balance. Sure, she starts it in the, in the earlier past, gives it some weight distributions along the way to prepare the population, but we're not collecting data then. And then she starts collecting data in 2008. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so this is the, the notion of burn in. And for MCMC, this is critical. You burn in the, you, you, you burn it in. You, you, you almost universally throw out the first bunch because it's contaminated by the vagaries of what initial point you started at. And you don't want it to be contingent on that. Does that make sense? Other questions about this? I know this is kind of abstract. Yeah, it is. So, um, so here, this is something called the uh, random walk Metropolis Hastings algorithm. This is this is the, the sort of most common algorithm like that. Here we pick an, some initial value that is going to give us a non-zero posterior. And then we basically are going to loop. We're going to pick a value for a perturbation, something that will sort of it will, will be a variation on this. It will be a sort of little delta, which will be a variation. We create a candidate, which is the current value plus that variation. And then, then we sense the posterior at that candidate versus the current posterior. The current posterior is this guy here, okay? And, and if that, and, and we're going to draw a value from 0 to 1 uniformly, and if it's less than this, which it always will be if this, the posterior at the new, the candidate point is greater than this, if it's less than or equal to that, which it always will be if it's, if that one's better than this one, we'll accept it and otherwise will reject it and just emit the current value again. And basically, we, we uh, emit either that, that new one or the, the repeated one if, if we didn't accept, and we go back and we iterate. And this is what allows us to sample from this distribution. This calculation of the posterior involves calculating the likelihood. And to calculate the likelihood, guess what you need to do? One of my students, Guess what you need to do? You run the model. <laughs> Bang on. <laughs> Good man. That's, that's great. That's exactly right. That's right. Um, you run it. OK? Um, uh, so what does MCMC work? Well, it turns out that you can prove MCMC works. It'll, it'll sample from the distribution associated with this, as implied by your likelihood function and your, your, your um, uh, prior, that implies a posterior distribution which will be sampled from. And basically it's sampling from parameters that allow good matches of the model, plausible matches of the model to the empirical data, recognizing there's some uncertainty, recognizing that many parameter values match it, okay? These parameters are fixed quantities. They stay the same throughout the simulation. They're not particle filter where we're changing over time our estimate of the underlying situation. They're, 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 they're fixed values, okay? So it turns out that this can be shown to, to precisely sample from um, the appropriate uh, distribution for the parameters, okay? Um, uh, so, the simulation model plays a critical role in this process. It's the simulation model that allows us to say, for a certain contact rate, for example, and a certain assumption about reporting fraction, what's the probability we would observe the output, um, the, the observed empirical data? That You got to run the model to see that. So this is critically running the model as part of that. So for every one of these iterations to calculate the posterior, which requires calculating this and then multiplying it by the, the value of the prior for that 
for that theta, for that value at the parameters, you're going to be running the model. Okay, and um, it turns out that you can, and Cheyenne knows quite a bit more about this now. In some cases, with enough sophistication, you can actually consider the identifier of the simulation model as another parameter. You can say, you can consider multiple models and say, and sample from those models, those sort of competing models, competing hypotheses for explaining the situation. This is much more sophisticated. I don't cover it here, but it's something which in theory can be done. Okay. Um, now, this requires significant computational effort. Running the simulation model often, um, but the simulation model will need to be run many times. Um, and sometimes you run it hundreds of thousands of times to sample from the parameter values, okay? Mm. And, and this, is, this is a very, um, this is a very intensive process uh, that might take um, hours to, to get different plausible values of parameters. But what you get out of here is not one privileged parameter value like you do out of calibration. You get a, a distribution of plausible parameter values. Then we could have a higher reporting rate and a lower contact rate, or we can have a higher contact rate and a lower reporting rate. Um, we might have a whole distri a joint distribution of this. And you can't parallelize this. So in our adaptations of this with PMCMC, for example, Lugia and, and, um, and Xiaoyan ran this in parallel with multiple walkers. So in other words, we run multiple such chains. This is called a, a chain. Um, we're running a Markov chain. In other words, we're going from one point, we get another point, we get another point, we get another point, and we call them a chain, okay? And we're generating, and each one might generate tens of thousands of samples, and we might run several of these at once that start at different uh, starting points and have different random, random variation within them. And why? Because we're exploring the space of plausible parameters, okay? Um, and this allows us to identify good assumptions for the model that are more, that don't put all their eggs in the basket of one assumption. Now, some practical concerns here. Um, one thing is there's the burning time. I said this earlier, typically we run it for a thousand or more iterations and throw them away. Another thing is we have to tune the parameters, in particular, particularly the size of this perturbation, the size, if, if we have a current one that's worked, we try to pick, the last one we accepted, we pick a, a, a variant of that, and, and how far out we go for that variant, the size of the so-called random perturbation, um, which we'll typically draw from a multivariate normal uh, distribution, how far out we go will have a big difference. If, it's, if we don't go out very far, will typically get uh, quite high acceptance rates, but we'll explore the space slowly. We won't find new parameter values that are really good too quickly, because we'll, we'll go slowly through the space. It's like you're, you're walking and you're putting your foot very cautiously in front of the other one. You're unlikely to trip, but you're not gonna go very far very quickly. By contrast, if you go further you uh, at a time, uh, you, you might explore space and get to some really good areas of space with high posterior values with really plausible matches that you'll end up sampling you know, from bountifully. But, um, but you might end up with many duds, which mean that you, you end up having a low acceptance rate. And so generally we want to have acceptance rates between like 20% and 80%. Some, some people like to recommend really high acceptance rates. And a lot of the art of running MCMC is tuning the size of this perturbation, the size of this disturbance, how far out we look for a variant that works so that we get the acceptance rate up at least into the 20s. 
This was an issue that Shao Yan and Luigi, I remember, may remember we struggled with with PMCMC, remember that? And we finally found some that got into the 20s, but they required lots and lots of particles, if you recall. Um, and lower R's. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Um, okay, so, uh, so that's a consideration. Um, I don't want to go into this because I think uh, you know, it, uh, it may belabor it too much. But I will say that if, if two parameters are really intertwined in their effects, um, it can lower efficiency if you're just kind of sampling them independently. And, and that can slow down your, your acceptance or could lower your acceptance rate as well. And there's some tricks to sort of dealing with that that are, are quite nice. You can, you can sort of reparameterize it or, or what have you. Um, uh, and you'll need to, ex to assess convergence, where basically you can assess, okay, has it gotten enough samples to be, to be really robust? Have we gotten enough to be confident we've really sampled the space well? There are several measures you can, do, you can use, including something called the Heidelberg-Welch statistics. There's also a test from uh, Gelman, who wrote a book, Bayesian Data Analysis. Um, uh, and um, and has uh, suggests using multiple walkers. Okay. Um, okay. Um, there's many variants of MCMC algorithms. I like the one I've just presented. That's the one I've used quite a bit. We'll share with you the R code and C code to implement it. But there's MCMC uh, walkers out there. Um, okay. So within the sphere of what we're talking about. Um, this MCMC is viewed as a close cousin of particle filtering. There are different goals. MCMC is to estimate parameter values of static parameters. Particle filtering is to estimate the underlying state over time. But they're viewed as being kind of close cousins. Um, uh, MCMC, we call it a batch Monte Carlo algorithm. It takes all the data at once and uses it. Particle filtering, as Lucia has, has taken advantage of, is a recursive, it's an incremental or sequential Monte Carlo method rather than a batch Monte Carlo method. Um, and um, here we're, we're formulating estimates for the sampling from the underlying state of the system um, uh, is, is how, we're, uh, how we're doing things. Okay, so that's, uh, I appreciate your patience with that. Um, uh, so, um, uh, mumble. Um, sorry, we're having some rhinos down in our home. And didn't come today either. Um, uh, so, in any case, this is MCMC. Um, it's it's a technique for sampling from parameter values that will match data. And when you have lots of data from the world, this can give you distributions for your parameter values in your simulation model that will match that data well and plausibly. What we're going to see tomorrow is going to build on this for a, an algorithm of incredible power. An algorithm that combines the best of this with the best of particle filtering. And that's an algorithm that allows us to simultaneously estimate, mark my words, simultaneously estimate the underlying state of the system over time, and the values of the parameters that are static. You may have seen us talk about, you may have seen me mumble about these parameters which we're exploring in particle filtering by allowing them to vary. And one reason we allow them to vary is so that we have the requisite humility a humbleness on the part of a model, model that befits it as a, a mere human creation. Um, that we're not sure that it, it represents how much of the truth it captures. And so we, and we know it's off base at some levels. We know it's, it's wrong, but it could be useful. Um, we know it's left out some things, inevitably you're misestimated. And so it needs a certain humility to match the data can't be too prideful of its anticipation. At the same time, um, we want it to be confident. 
And we had these parameters varying stochastically sometimes because we didn't know their true values. And we wanted it to be estimated in particle filter. We wanted to use particle filtering to estimate the value of that parameter. Well, it turns out that that's not the best way to estimate it. Part, what, mar, MCMC is a more reliable way to estimate the value of static parameters. But particle MCMC will allow us to estimate the value of those parameters while doing particle filtering. It'll allow us to estimate, for example, elements of the contact matrix that we don't think probably evolved too quickly. Or elements of the recovery time associated with a non-treatment mediated infection, um, which has some variability, but it's unlikely to evolve over the course of the, the model time frame that much. We sample it with MCMC. In short, MCMC provides the opportunity to estimate latent, uh, to estimate static quantities whose value we don't know, together with the latent state of the model, the underlying latent state. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a combination of profound significance. That gives us the ability to fill in the key gaps with the model and to keep it current. So ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow morning we shall see MCMC, PMCMC. Um, uh, and we're going to, we're going to uh, see a case study which uses PMCMC to look at opioid, opioid related burden within Cincinnati and using methods that could be applied to many jurisdictions with the appropriate support for data. Okay. So, so that's PMCMC tomorrow. It builds atop this basic foundation and essentially it's like a merging of MCMC and, 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 and part of the filter. We've got the same basic loop going on, the same loop over different values of parameters and assessing the posterior, all that's there. But in the middle of it, to assess the posterior, we're going to run particle filtering. And it's wild. It's wild. And it's great. And it's great. Take my word for it. Even if you don't throw the cushions in the air. Um, <laughs> OK, it's, it's, it's great. Um, so we'll see this uh, tomorrow, OK? Um, so, so that's for PMCMC. Now, um, the afternoon is still early. <laughs> so I want to add a bit of, of liveliness um, uh, to the room. And, uh, and I'm, uh, I would like to, I would like to